Welcome to our latest webinar and thank you for joining us. I hope you're all well and staying safe. I'm going to be handing over to our expert speaker very shortly, but to begin, a couple of notes regarding the webinar platform we are using. The main thing you need to know is that you can direct questions to our speaker for today via the Q&A option on your toolbar at any time throughout the webinar. The toolbar is likely to be at the foot of your screen. If you cannot see the toolbar, just hover around the bottom of your screen and it will appear. Once located, simply type your question into the text box provided and click or tap submit. We'll run through questions with the speaker once the talk is complete. Secondly, you are all on mute. As with all of our webinars, this is nothing against you. It just helps the webinar run smoothly without distractions or background noise. The webinar is being recorded and will be available in the coming days via our website, YouTube channel, and if you have opted in to receive emails from us, you will receive an email with the recording link. For those watching the webinar as a recording, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at any time using the details on your screen now. So very quickly, you're watching a Society for the Environment webinar. We hold the two professional registers for environmental professionals, the Chartered Environmentalist or CM register and the Registered Environmental Technician or RM Tech register. The Society operates as an umbrella organisation, currently made up of 24 professional bodies known as our licensed members. All of these professional bodies hold a licence granted by the Society to award the CM registration to their members. Three of these also offer the RF Tech registration, which are now highlighted. To become a CM for RM Tech, you will need to be a member of and apply via one of these professional bodies. You'll be joining nearly 7,500 registrants from across sexes and disciplines. And as of this month, we have registered 10,000 chartered environmentalists in total. If you want to find out more, please visit sofgenv.org.uk or inquire with the relevant professional body directly. So, onto the webinar itself. The aim of our numerous webinar series is to increase knowledge transfer opportunities for environmental professionals and interested parties. This webinar is the final part of a special series running this week in celebration of World Environment Day, which is tomorrow, the 5th of June. Each year we champion World Environment Day in the UK and beyond. This year, the global theme for World Environment Day is biodiversity, a topic which registered environmental professionals agree is hugely important for the environment, both currently and looking to the future. Today we are focusing on engaging the public on biodiversity, a subject we are very passionate about and are working to encourage by our dedicated campaign and support of 30 Days Wild. More on that later. Now it's time to introduce our expert speaker for today. We are delighted to welcome Becky Fisher, Education and Engagement Manager at Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. In today's talk, Becky will outline the trust approach to public engagement, which focuses on behaviour change and community empowerment. So, um, a huge welcome to Becky. Are you with us? I am. Good afternoon, everybody. Great. Thanks, Becky. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, and if you're all set, it's, it's over to you. Great. So, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, as Sarah said, I'm Becky Fisher. I'm the Engagement Manager for Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. And I've worked for the Trust now uh, for about two years or two and a half years. I previously worked for another wildlife trust in Berkshire and I have a master's in behaviour change from the University of Derby, specifically focusing on the environment and conservation. What I'm going to tell you a bit about today is Hampshire and Isle White Wildlife Trust's new strategy, particularly our public engagement uh, part of it and all the thinking that came with it. It's a really new approach for us and we're really hoping that it will tip the balance in nature's favour, connect more people to nature and crucially inspire them to take action. So first up, who are we? So uh, Hampshire and Alouette Wildlife Trust are one of 46 individual wildlife trusts across the UK. We're all independent charities, but we share a vision of connecting people with nature, enhancing our land and seas for wildlife. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust is actually 60, year, 60 years old next year and we deliver educational visits, events, family activities, groups for young people and community engagement projects. And we manage over 50 nature reserves and work with landowners across the two counties to enhance their land for nature. 
So what I'm going to talk you through today was born out of the fact that despite our best efforts, wildlife is still declining and people are still disconnected to nature. And we needed to take a look at what we were doing and how we might improve it to make more of a difference. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but I just wanted to give you a bit of context. I'm sure you're all aware that the vast majority of our species are declining and some at a really rapid rate. Despite many of Hampshire and Isle of Wildlife Trust's nature reserves a slowing or reverse of this decline, we know that this just isn't enough to make the major changes required to save our wildlife. And despite concern about the environment being at the highest levels on record with uh, the monitor of engagement with the natural environment data showing that 90% of people are concerned about damage to the natural environment, only 4% of people are taking the much more difficult action of giving money or time to conservation. So there's a gap between what people are saying and what they do, and this is often referred to as the value action gap. So this is the context in which the Trust built its wilder strategy. And what is that strategy? Well, as you can see on the screen, our vision is for a wilder Hampshire and Isle of Wight. We want nature's recovery to be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. We want broken ecosystems restored and missing wildlife to return. And we want people to benefit from a healthy natural environment. And this boils down to two things which you can see at the bottom of the screen. We need more people on nature's side and more space for wildlife to thrive. And we're splitting this into three key aims. And um, those are, we need one in four people to take action for nature's recovery. We need a third of land and sea to be where wildlife is recovering. And we need the pressure on nature reduced everywhere else. So I'm not gonna go into detail today about our aims for a third of land and sea or reduced pressure, but if you'd like more information, you can take a look at the website, uh, which is on the bottom left hand of your screen. Um, but I will talk you through uh, the thinking behind one in four people. And we're delivering our strategy through three main strands. Uh, I'll mainly be focusing on the guide and support and the influence change and inspire action strategies today, but I will make a comment on our direct delivery, specifically talking about our environmental education. Okay, so onto the science and the thinking behind it. It's probably worth mentioning at this point that our strategy is a 10 year one. Uh, we felt that this fitted well with the discourse around having uh, only a decade left to reverse the ecological and uh, climate crisis. So, starting with a note on traditional environment, environmental education, well this has been our bread and butter for many years and in fact we opened our first education centre over 25 years ago and we still believe that there's power and importance in teaching people about the natural environment. Without some knowledge you just can't get to know wildlife and you can't love or want to protect something that you don't know anything about. However, our educational visits, family events, and any people engagement delivery um, will include opportunities for the three things you can see on the screen now going forwards. The first is to learn about the basic biological processes of life. Now, you might be quite surprised to hear me say this. As a wildlife trust, you'd expect we'd be teaching about these things. But as the years have progressed, we've expanded our programmes to offer more and more curriculum based subjects outdoors. And we want to bring our teaching back in line with first principles so that everything we teach, whether that's science, history or art, will always include those environmental principles. So to give you an example, uh, we run a living history day which covers the Iron Age and going forwards, this will have a much stronger focus on biodiversity and the differences from then and now. Um, as we rework, we will also make sure that we're still covering all of the required national curriculum points, uh, as that's what encourages schools to book in the first place. And then we're also going to include uh, Nature Connection. So you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, the pathways to nature connectedness. These have been developed by the University of Derby and the Nature Connectedness Research Group. Um, and we feel that nature connection, or it's proven that nature connection is important for two reasons. One, uh, it has a um, positive impact on our health and well-being, but also it's been found that those who have a higher connection to nature are more likely to perform pro-environmental behaviours. Um, we think that the reasons for having an opportunity for nature connection in everything we do, not just for children and for adults, um, has been shown by the University of Derby recently in a piece of research they did. And this shows that 
uh, using the monitor of engagement with the natural environment data, they were able to measure the nature connectedness of uh, the UK population. Um, so nature connection is a scale. Uh, you ask, get asked a few questions and that gives you a score. Uh, and they found that the average score of the UK is around 60. But in fact, to actually be performing behaviours. So if we think back to an earlier slide, uh, those more difficult behaviours about giving time and um, money to conservation, you actually need a score of 70. So there's quite a long way to go. And that's one of the many reasons we'll be ensuring nature connection is in everything we do. And finally, uh, we want to give the appropriate messages at the appropriate time. Uh, so we're really keen to try and reduce ecophobia and eco-anxiety, which has been really prevalent in recent years. And we're following the work of an American educator, David Sabell, whose book is in the photograph. Um, and lots of what he says is mirrored by the pathways to nature connectedness. He proposes that the formative years for bonding with nature uh, have three stages of development, and these are ages four to seven, eight to 11, and 12 to 15, although there is some flexibility in these. He argues that children need immersion and interaction in close, knowable landscapes. And we take, the, take them away from these landscapes when we ask them to deal with distant environmental problems. So he proposes there should be three phases of education to match those stages of development. Firstly, the activities in the early years, four to seven, should be about developing empathy for the natural world by fostering a sense of wonder and connecting with the everyday common wildlife. Much of what we do with education is about this. And this doesn't mean we won't be encouraging younger children to take part in pro-environmental behaviours. In fact, we model everything we would expect to see, and we encourage those who visit us for education to do the same. But instead of launching into a large explanation of why we use a reusable water bottle and explaining about ocean plastics, we'll simply answer children's questions as they arise until the appropriate time occurs to have those wider conversations with them. The second stage is middle childhood, so the 8 to 11, and this should really be about exploration and knowing your place. So children will be encouraged to follow streams and pathways, build forts and make miniature worlds. And in early ad adolescence, social action should take a much more prominent role. So I really like David Sabell's policy for social action here, which is no tragedies before fourth grade. That's around year five in the UK. He defines the tragedies as big, complex problems beyond the geographical and conceptual scope of children. And he suggests that we need to engage children at the early adolescent age with social issues that they can have a real tangible impact on. And that's something we completely agree with. Our Secrets of the Solent project, a public engagement project, which is trying to raise awareness and uh, change behaviours around the Solent, has a great example of this. We've been working with five schools on both sides of the Solent, so the Hampshire and Isle of Wight coasts, to empower them to take action in their own communities. A favourite of mine is the group who decided to buy a machine that turns plastic bottles into guitar plectrums. The school now sell the plectrums to raise funds for other environmental projects and the young people came up with this idea themselves. Our project officer supported them to learn about the plastic pollution problem but she was very specific about how it affected them and the seas near them rather than what was happening on the other side of the world and the young people came up with a solution that they could enact. And these ways of delivering environmental education also fit really well with our ambitions to expand our programmes. We already deliver an excellent for a school delivery and training programme, and we've seen firsthand the benefits of spending time in nature, connecting, exploring and learning uh, about the natural world can bring. So we intend to offer many more opportunities for repeat engagement like this. So going on to the strategy. Well, we started with two main concepts. Uh, both of these are business concepts and they were um, found first discovered by my CEO. She wanted to see how we might be able to combine these into our work. So the first is start with why. Uh, and this is Simon Sinek's work where he talks about the golden circle. And everything you should do should always come back to your why, your purpose, your cause and the belief that drives you. Now for the Wildlife Trust, this is very much about wildlife. We do what we do because we want to protect wildlife. We love it. We think it's wonderful. We want other people to enjoy it. So we test everything we do by coming back to our why. And we'll continue to do this as we progress with our strategy. The second idea is the tipping point, something uh, coined by Malcolm Gladwell. 
And this is the idea that there will always be some people who will follow everything you do. The classic example here is the iPhone and Apple. There's always some people, around 2.5% of the population, who will queue outside on midnight to get the latest phone. And that's the same with anyone. Our members uh, and our key supporters will always follow what we do. Going on, there's then the early adopters. So that's around 13.5%. And these might not be the people who buy the phone the first day it's out, but they're usually gonna catch up within the following week. And slowly but surely, as more people become involved, uh, you reach a tipping point, usually around the 25%. And when that 25% are doing something, the rest of the population tend to follow. Now, there'll always be some people who are further behind, but by that point, you've got something that's running really fast and it uh, has become popular. So we wanted to see whether or not this could be applied in the conservation sector. And we found this piece of research uh, which suggests that in the social sector, it may be. So this research suggests that if 25% of people, or one in four, are at taking action, uh, and it must be visible actions, it can't be a private action, they must be sharing what they're doing, then the rest of the population will begin thinking, well, those people are doing it, maybe I should be too. So then we needed to consider how we might actually create this tipping point. And this is where the behaviour change and systems modelling comes in. So I wanted to give you a sense of the wide ranging influences on our behaviour. So on the screen now, you will see um, a systems model of wildlife gardening. So I created this part of my dissertation last year, and it's been developed from existing research on wildlife gardening, but also from interviews that I conducted uh, with participants in Portsmouth who had access to urban gardens. So I'm not expecting you to read all of this slide, but as you can see, there are a huge range of influences on our behavior, and a lot of things need to happen for us to behave in a certain way. We're also drawing on the research of others to understand what encourages people to make a change. So the research on the left of the screen is particularly useful as it addresses behavioural science and conservation specifically. It looks at the cognitive biases and social influences on our behaviour. And I'll just give you a couple of examples from here. So cognitive biases are the shortcuts and rules of thumb we use to make decisions. For example, the status quo bias details how people prefer to maintain the status quo you're much more likely to stick with the default option, so it's useful to consider what they might be. And the classic example here is reducing paper use through using double-sided printing. If all your printers in your office are sent to double-sided automatically, then people are much more likely to use it, as they'd have to opt out if they didn't want to. And the essential thing with default options is it should always be possible to opt out. And an example from social influence. Well, humans are profoundly influenced by our desire to fit in and to be liked. We're more likely to behave environmentally if we think others know that what we are doing. So sharing what others are up to and making this visible is a key way of influencing behaviour. And I particularly like the work of Rare and the Behavioural Insights team, uh, whose research is on the right here. And they categorise ways of changing behaviour into three main, main types. You'll notice there's some overlap here between the two pieces of research. The first they talk about is motivating the change. So they say that different things motivate us to take action and sometimes these are in conflict with each other. We're not always aware of our motivations and this can affect our decision making processes. So ways to change behaviour that motivate it are by using positive emotions instead of uh, negative or fear personalising messages to individuals and communities and talking about how it might affect them and framing your messages to people's personal values, identities or interests. And this is why when it comes to behaviour change it's really important to know your audience. Blanket messaging and blanket interventions don't work for everyone. They also talk about socialising the change. So as I've already said humans are deeply social creatures and we're evolved to be social. Our behaviour is guided by what other people are doing and by the rules and expectations of our society. So to socialise the change, you need to promote what, others, what you want to see as normal. So what other people are doing, sharing success stories and encouraging public and peer-to-peer -peer commitments. Uh, and choosing your messenger here is really key. 
so spreading your message through your message through someone who is important in the community rather than it coming from your organization can be much more powerful and finally uh, they talk about easing the change so there's a direct relationship between motivation and ease of action and the less we are motivated to do something the much easier it must be so by making it easy you should remove barriers and frictions simplify your messages and use prompts and reminders to get people to do things and what's really important here is that you must provide people with support to do the action so training support networks and group activities doing things together are really important we're also drawing on the work of Henry Timms and Jeremy Hymans to try and understand what makes people move towards shaping the movement with us we want to open up some of our structure of the organisation to encourage more people to be involved in sharing their ideas, having a say in the work we do and creating and sharing content. We want to move from the messages and decisions always coming from us to something which is more participatory, a kind of crowdsourcing ideas. So how do we bring all of these concepts together? So we're moving more and more towards using models of behaviour change to help us build new projects. In fact, our two most recent large projects, which have been funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, have used the ISM, the model on the left, to create their implementation plans. And we're using the behaviour change wheel, the one on the right, to help us identify key behaviours that we want to change as an organisation and to measure and ensure the success of our 10 year strategy. So what does this mean in practice for us? Well, drawing all these concepts together has taken a good 18 months and everyone involved with the trust has had the opportunity to input, including trustees, staff, volunteers, members and supporters. We've held workshops and brought in external input. What it's resulted in is a plan that includes some of the things on the screen. So Team Wilder is about identifying support and training champions. Those are volunteers who would do something on behalf of the trust and leaders, those who are already leading change in their own communities and enabling them to take action for wildlife, campaign for change and inspires others. And this includes being able to identify themselves as part of something bigger. So we're providing branding and toolkits to help with this. And we're also celebrating and sharing successes through our Wilder Annual Awards, which are open to anyone, uh, whether they're involved with the Trust or not. And we're encouraging people to help us write blogs, press and to do takeovers of our social media. We're supporting communities to get together and make a difference on their doorsteps by creating wilder streets or adopting existing green space and road verges to manage them for wildlife and people. And we're producing a much stronger way for young people to get involved with the trust, exploring options for a youth council. Crucially, we're embedding nature in everyday life by working with schools, businesses, healthcare professionals and more to ensure that nature is a part of the curriculum, our workplaces and our daily lives. And we'll be providing this through training, coffee and catch up sessions and lots of ideas sharing. We recognise there's a huge wealth of knowledge and expertise that exists beyond our organisation. And we want to empower people to share this with us and others. So our new project, Wild of Portsmouth, brings all of these together. We have an officer who is there to support and make the right connections. But ultimately, the work he does is dictated by the communities he's working with. This way of working has its challenges. You need to ensure you're reaching beyond the usual suspects. So it's key to make connections with different groups and put nature on their agendas. And it's participatory nature also means you can't give a funder clear outcomes at the outset. So you need a funder who is happy to work with you on wider aims rather than specific figures. And we're really lucky to have such a funder in the Southern Co-op. But the benefits are far reaching. In the last six months since we started the project, we've already seen densely populated streets create space for wildlife on their doorsteps. Residents adopt forgotten patches of land at the end of their streets and churches and communal meeting places enhance their gardens. But also their small, often neglected patches around the buildings, all for wildlife. And how have we adapted to the current situation? Well, we have had to adapt our delivery and our messaging for this situation. Many of our project staff, uh, engagement and, in, and education staff have been furloughed and we've kept a skeleton staff to continue with engagement. We've not stopped our ambitious plans, but we have slowed them and we've had to send everything online. The key thing that's remained important for us is communicating with our members and supporters. 
and we're hosting regular virtual meetups for different groups. I recently completed a survey with nearly 600 residents asking them what they've noticed during this time and changes that they'd like to see. The most important focus for us has been talking to our audiences and keeping those conversations going so we don't lose momentum. As well as communicating messages around everyday nature, the spectacular species you can find on your doorstep, we've really been focusing on the health and well-being benefits of being outside. We're also focusing our efforts on advocacy, working nationally with other wildlife trusts and other environmental NGOs to ensure the messages of a green recovery and the nature-based solutions we can provide reach the widest audience. So thank you for listening, everybody. I know we have an opportunity now for questions, but if you would like to know more, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. My email address and my Twitter are on the screen now. Thank you, Becky. Um, that was, I thought that was a really great insight and um, it's great to hear about all your successes with your approach. So thank you so much. Um, for everyone watching, it's a Q and A time now. Okay, so if you haven't already, uh, now's the time to ask a question or two to Becky using the Q&A function within your toolbar. Uh, we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. So, um, first question, um, you've touched, Becky, on how you approach empowering the public um, and sort of a related question here. Um, sort of quite a lot of biodiversity rich and green land is, is owned and therefore is in sort of public space as such. Um, given this, how, how can we ensure local people engage with and are empowered to protect the biodiversity in that area? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I think there's kind of two elements to how we do this, really. The first is that uh, we need to share the stories of those spaces. So. Um, not just talking about what's being done and how and the biodiversity impacts, but also about the people who are managing the land. So um, psychologist Robert, Robert Caldini is kind of, he, um, he outlined how we might persuade people and his research suggests that you're much more likely to, li to uh, listen to the person and be persuaded by them if you like them. Um, so I think it's kind of crucial that uh, we're out there finding these people and sharing their stories so that one, the story is not always coming from us, but two, people are learning more about those people um, and who they are and, and why they get involved and crucially what, you know, what they think of the land and how important it is and the biodiversity impact they're having. And I think probably the second part of this is shifting the narrative. So yes, we have really amazing biodiversity rich places and, um, we can't access those and in some ways that that's great for nature but also it shouldn't be something that's sort of over there um that's separate from us and um things like our gardens um you know combined they're they're a huge size they're 270,000 hectares so actually they're larger than some of our kind of major rewilding sites so we should be empowering people to consider their own spaces and how that they have an impact on biodiversity as well um, and we should be encouraging them to do whatever they can and and kind of telling them that that matters too absolutely um i thought that's a really good overview there um another question here i've got is um, as an environmental advisor within the nuclear industry, uh, what can I do to raise environmental awareness within the workforce? So I think here it's sort of key that, that it's sort of um, environmental professionals working within sort of different sectors. So perhaps not perhaps not the core environmental sectors. Um, yeah. What can they do to raise awareness within their organisations? It's a really great question because. Uh, working in the environmental sector it does sometimes sound or feel like you're shouting into a void you're telling the same people the same messages um, I suppose really the key thing that I always come back to is about um, understanding what other people value so a lot of people don't value nature for nature's sake but they do value their health they do value their family's health they value uh, having clean air or enjoying being outside um, so I suppose the way to communicate with with other people in in other sectors is to find out what's important to them and frame the way you're messaging um, to them and the other thing is that you know, if we go back to, to easing the change um, 
there's lots of things you can do, particularly within a workplace where you can encourage people um, to change their behavior or behave in a certain way by changing the structure around them. So, you know, double-sided printing is the exact classic example, but recycling bins, enabling opportunities to work from home, all of these things um, can be decided upon, um, obviously whilst talking to your colleagues and your employees, but you know, you can make these changes by making them as easy as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, a sort of related question we've had here is, is, is sort of touching on um, the impact of the current situation of, of the COVID related restrictions on, on our everyday lives. And I know you spoke a bit about, about the kind of um, how you've adapted your approach slightly. Um, but in terms of the impact of the current situation on on sort of, you know, we've seen a lot of people report that they're really enjoying cleaner air and um, and that sort of thing. So the sort of positive impacts of this current situation. How how do you think we can? Um, how do you think that could impact how how people have engaged with nature now and how it will? How do we keep that going going forward? How how does that become sort of the the new normal, so to speak? Yeah, I think I mean we we get a lot of reports of people saying how amazing it is, and we're all feeling it ourselves. I speak to my colleagues all the time about new wildlife we've spotted and the fact that we can hear the bird song. I suppose the key thing here is that um, this situation has has shown how amazing it can be and how much of a benefit it can be. Um, the survey that I mentioned, uh, ninety seven percent of the people who came back said that nature had had an impact on their health and well being during this time. But it isn't the same for everybody. So everybody can get the benefits, but not everyone has the same access. Um, so I suppose the big kind of legacy from this is that we really need to ensure that everyone has access to nature in some way. So we should be building new housing with opportunities for green space. And, um, you know, the more biodiverse they can be, the better. But actually, just the opportunity to get out for everyone, whether you live in a tiny flat in the center of a densely packed city like Portsmouth or uh, in the middle of the beautiful Hampshire countryside it's um it's really key that we campaign for more space for everybody um, and more space for everybody and all the benefits that come with that also means more space for wildlife. Yeah absolutely um, it's sort of that that link isn't it between the sort of social and environmental I think is really important and I think this situation has really kind of shown shown that um, I just wanted to give you maybe a bit of an opportunity to touch on um, the 30 Day As Well campaign as well. I don't know if you yeah. wanted to say anything about that and how that sort of, I think, really links into what we're discussing now about, you know, like um, little things making a big difference and the fact that everybody can do something to help biodiversity. Yeah, so those who haven't heard of 30 Days Wild, um, the idea is that for every day in June, you do a random act of wildness. So every wildlife trust across the country is running this, and there's a wildlife trust in every county. Um, and the idea is that you sign up, uh, and we send you kind of uh, really easy, simple activities you can do. Ordinarily, you'd have got a pack in the post, but everything's gone digital this year. Um, and the, the thinking behind it is that you, uh, by doing one very simple thing in nature or for nature, um, your nature connection will increase. So we have worked with the University of Derby. Uh, they've been studying it for the last five years for us. Um, and they're finding that uh, nature connection does increase for everyone. And it's even more important for people who uh, have a lower score of nature connection. So um, the impacts are higher, so their health and their happiness is, is higher than others um, and improved more. Um, but also their, their connection to nature and their willingness to do something becomes uh, more as well. So I suppose the idea behind it is that you don't need to visit a nature reserve or um, do something really complicated. You don't need a lot of time or a lot of money or um, to be in what we would traditionally think of as a beautiful place to actually um, get real benefits from connecting to everyday nature. Um, and that, you know, that is, that's the call from the wildlife trust that we, we are part of nature. We are um, 
we are just as much nature as everything else is and all those tiny little things even the weeds in the pavement are nature and by noticing them you will feel better uh, and the more you notice them the more you want to do something to protect it yeah absolutely um i think as well there's a question here about um please would you provide ideas on how to encourage kids to value environment at, at home uh, particularly in this sort of pandemic era um in terms of 30 days wild i know there's a big focus on on resources for kids uh, for the younger generation and and similarly with our um world environment day campaign um hub which i'll talk a bit about later as well um so, so do, do you have anything to add about a sort of i know you spoke as well in your presentation about um the importance of of getting this message across to the younger generation yeah i think the i mean the most the best thing you can do to encourage children to want to do something for nature is to introduce them to it so we're not we're all born i mean i'm sure everyone can remember we're we're all born loving wildlife we all want to sit in the garden and pick up worms and kind of notice birds flying overhead and all that sort of stuff we lose that as we as we grow up because it's it's not seen as normal so we're going back to that behavior and, you know i was always always the strange one as i you know got older and particularly when i became a teenager and i was still talking about wildlife it was really strange but it never left me because i always had the opportunity to enjoy it and it's not just about learning the science or getting up close it's about um to go back to the pathways it's about enabling opportunities to uh, see beauty and uh, make art from wildlife and um to listen to birdsong and so as many opportunities in as many different ways uh really simple easy things and things like 30 days wild if you signed up for that which you can still do now um it will give you all of those really simple ideas. It's all built from the pathways to nature connection. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I know, I know as well um, that people uh, sign up to 30 days wild uh, there's an option to do 365 days wild as well, isn't there? Um, and so, so the idea is, you know, 30 days wild gets, gives people the ideas and uh, to, to, to do all these activities. And then the hope is that, you know, they'll carry it on um, beyond June itself. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah so you feel you'll feel the benefits from doing 30 days wild for at least two months afterwards even if you stop so even come the end of june if you stop going out in nature every day in september you'll still feel happier and healthier so it's lasting impact um however like you say if you if you join up for 365 days wild um you will get a lot more and actually that's a really nice example of this um of other people taking control so we didn't coin 365 days wild someone else did um a member of the public started it loved it and wanted to carry on and there's now a huge facebook group of people sharing their own ideas um and uh, lots of people share with hashtags and all that sort of stuff about what they're up to so um from a, a campaign point of view that's really amazing for us because the content is coming from the people who we would want to be involved and they're making it themselves uh, so we're just there to support them and guide them along the way but um it, that's not the only you know it doesn't need lots and lots of ideas and support from us yeah i mean that's amazing i think um, i suppose that's a real example of the kind of behavior change and community empowerment that you know you're talking about in this in this presentation that um because you know that, that you can really see that people have really engaged with it and are coming up with their own sort of ideas and and taking the momentum forward so that's amazing um there's a there's another question here um their work involves environmental protect promotion and advocacy and yeah. do you have any experience dealing with groups of people or individuals who disagree who or are against your campaign about biodiversity and, and how do you sort of deal with that Oh yeah, we we have people who we come across people who disagree all the time. I think for me the the key thing that that's important to do, and it, it comes back to this idea of persuasion, is you're much more likely to listen to somebody if you actually 
uh, know them and like them. So often in that situation, I stop having the conversation about whatever it was we were arguing about and I try and find some common ground. Um, and it's usually, you can usually find it. Uh, you know, there will always be some people you can't, but um, you can usually find something that you agree on and then bring the conversation back round. And we do this with all audiences. Before we start a project, we don't go into communities and talk to them about the environment or biodiversity. We go into communities and talk to them about their area and their lives. We want to find out where the school is, where's the local shop, you know, which routes do they walk? Have they seen a robin recently? You know, and then you start those conversations. So I guess that's that's the best way to approach it is if if you're finding you're sticking with somebody who really can't see your side of things is to take a step back and see what you do agree on and what is their agenda and their values that you can pin biodiversity to. So we can't expect everybody to love nature for nature's sake but we can expect that they'll have shared values with us. And it also doesn't matter if it, of course, eventually we'd love that. If everybody loved wildlife and wanted to do something for it, then, I mean, ultimately our jobs wouldn't be required, but we can't expect that right from the start. So we have to try and understand the other things that motivate people. And if they're motivated to behave in the way that we want them to, does it really matter if their values match ours? Possibly not. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, um, and you've spoken quite a bit about sort of health and well-being and and that that kind of link with biodiversity and nature. I think that that's something that comes through a lot. Is that is that? Um, do you think that's sort of one of the key messages that that you talk to people about the sort of health and well-being? Um, aspects of like what you know why biodiversity is important yeah yeah absolutely I mean if we if we go back um to, to Portsmouth Portsmouth is our our kind of shining example at the moment of our urban work but um a lot of the conversations we're having with people are about reducing air pollution and um enabling their streets to be safer so that they can cycle and walk and um though those things that you know that health and well-being aspect of things I don't know anybody who wouldn't say that they value their health and the health of the people that they love um and you know it, there's lots and lots of research now that not only says that just in everyday nature is important but actually more biodiverse so the more biodiverse an area is the better the health benefits are for you so it you know it this behavior change stuff is never going to be a silver bullet we're never going to change everyone's opinion and it's really hard to change behavior but it does feel like by encouraging people to think about the health and well-being and um linking that with nature and biodiversity that it feels a bit of a win-win really definitely um i completely agree with that i think i think um just going back to the question um, regarding sort of people that might disagree or be against what you're doing, I think as mm. well, um, I mean, you touched on it in your presentation about sort of eco anxiety. Um, do, do you find that um, a, sort of in addition to maybe people kind of uh, disagreeing with your work that, that some people are just quite overwhelmed by the situation um, and that sort of eco anxiety side of things. And, and, and I know you spoke a bit about it before, but do you have anything to add about, um how you how you deal with that kind of um if you come across people that say that yeah i mean if i'm honest me and my colleagues have felt it it's mm. it's hard not to sometimes think what am i doing this this is never going to work you know i i'm really struggling here nothing i do is making a change i suppose the conversations we tend to have are especially with young people, because I think they're feeling it most. So that, that teenage, that kind of uh, early adolescence and, um, and into early 20s feeling that, you know, we're, we're making a mess of this and we're, we're never going to reverse the problem. And we often talk about small, tangible things that they can do. So we try to, re to move away from the big, scary conversations. You do have to have those sometimes because you need to put it into context but certainly for me I feel that 
I can, if I can make small changes to my own environment, sometimes that doesn't feel enough, but it's a start. And then what we do is connect people with each other. And that's one of the kind of key things we've had feedback on so far is we've had lots and lots of people say to us, oh, well, I, I didn't know there were all these people that felt the same way as I do and that were doing the same thing as I do. You know, we've got, we've got a set of villages in the Test Valley. There's about six of them. Um, and they had kind of one or two people in each village who were really keen on biodiversity and really wanted to do something for nature. And um, we've connected them together. And by connecting them together, they've been able to share resources and share knowledge and share fears. And, you know, they're really working together now to make a really tangible difference in their area. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's something, you know, the Society for the Environment, we would really um, sort of agree with. Um, obviously, we're, we're an umbrella body. We work with so many different organisations and um, environmental pro professionals from all different sectors. So absolutely, I think um, the co collaboration and, and bringing people together is so important to um, sort of keeping people engaged and to making as much difference as possible. So we completely agree with that. Um, and I think that's that's it for the questions. Um, thank you so much, Becky. And um, I thought they were, you gave some really great answers there. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I'm just going to uh, move on now just to close the webinar um, with some further opportunities you might be interested in. Thanks very much. Thank you. So um, as we've been speaking about in this webinar, um, we've been doing a lot of to do with biodiversity and our biodiversity related work. Um, today might mark the end of this webinar series, but there's still plenty of opportunity to engage with biodiversity this June and beyond. Tomorrow, as we've said, is World Environment Day. And as mentioned earlier, we are involved in a campaign celebrating biodiversity. So why not check out our recently launched biodiversity website hub, developed in collaboration with key partners, including the Wildlife Trust. Here you will find tons of resources and inspirational ideas on how you can help to protect and enhance the biodiversity that we all live amongst. Uh, we're looking for actions large and small. They all make a really positive difference as we've been talking about during this webinar itself. Um, so to get involved, please visit socm.org.uk forward slash biodiversity 2020. And if you can't get enough of all things nature and biodiversity, this month's episode of our podcast series, Interviews with Environmental Professionals, launched yesterday. A World Environment Day special, which sees our Vice Chair, Dougal Driver, CM, Chief Executive of Grown in Britain, and Chief Executive of LEAF, Linking Environment and Farming, Chief Executive Caroline Drummond, MBE, CM, in conversation on all things biodiversity. Make sure to listen and subscribe via socm.org.uk forward slash podcast. Uh, later this year, we have our next webinar series, which is based around the topic of natural capital. So if you're a CM or RM Tech and you have a project that you'd like to showcase and allow other environmental professionals to learn from, some top tips that other sectors should consider in their work, or guidance on how you have implemented relevant standards and frameworks, please do get in touch with me. If you're interested to hear more about the CM or RM Tech registers, please take a look at our How to Become and Why Become recorded webinars on our website. You'll also find all the recordings from our last series, which was a sustainable built environment. And then we also had the climate change series. Um, they will be joined by the recording of this webinar series shortly. They're also available on the Society for the Environment YouTube channel, where you can subscribe to gain notifications of new webinar recordings and other SOCM content. In partnership with MEMCOM, we have coordinated a sustainability day, which is full of talks, seminars and panel discussions, which takes place tomorrow, which, as mentioned before, is World Environment Day. This day, focused around sustainable working, will bring to, close, to a close the MEMCOM Interactive, an interactive conference which has been taking place all this week. The sustainability day programme includes talks and discussions with the Society's Chair, Professor William Pope. CM, our Chief Executive Dr Emma Wilcox and Chartered Environmentalist David Simmons, UK Director of Sustainability of, UK, of WSB in the UK, among many others. 
To find out more and register to, att register to attend for free, please visit the website address on the screen now. Finally, and also tomorrow, um, annually we showcase the achievements and commitment to environmental good practice of our registrants via the SOCAMP Awards. The nominations are now closed and the finalists have been decided. For the first time this year, we have two awards up for grabs, the Environmental Professional of the Year, and in a new award for 2020, the Registrant Newcomer of the Year. The announcement of the award winners and highly commended finalists will be an online affair this year, taking place tomorrow, at 4 p.m. UK time. For this, I'd like to encourage you to join the live announcement on Zoom and show your support for the outstanding work of the finalists. It's a free event, so please register your attendance via the website address on your screen. And that's it from us today. Thank you for listening and taking part and to all our excellent contributors for this to this series. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell to gain notifications of new videos and tap on the big thumbs up like button. That would be great. Many thanks again to Becky today for the, her excellent content. And we will see you in the next webinar when our next series begins this autumn. Don't miss it. Thank you for watching and stay safe.